In this video, I'm going to introduce Hess's Law in a simple and easy to follow way that's going to help you to understand Hess's Law. And we're also going to look at how to do the calculations with a worked example. So let's start with a big rule, the kind of fundamental basis of Hess's Law. And that is that the route that a chemical reaction takes does not affect the enthalpy change. So regardless what way you look at it, you can always calculate the same change in enthalpy. So you could look at a reaction as going reactant straight to products. And the enthalpy change for that is actually going to be exactly the same as if you went from the reactants to some intermediate step or steps, and then those intermediates turned into your final products. And both of those two routes, the rule is that delta H is going to be the same either way. So your change in enthalpy does not depend on the path. And textbooks often say things like it's independent of the path. And that just means it doesn't matter what way you go, as long as you start and finish in the same place and your path is valid, you're going to get the same value of delta H regardless of how you do the calculation. And you can see this in terms of a diagram. So we could define an axis as being our enthalpy axis. We're going to have some reactants that have a certain enthalpy associated with them. So we're going to have that line represent the reactants. Then the products are perhaps going to be lower. So we've got an exothermic reaction here. And we can simply put an arrow on to indicate our change in enthalpy. So our change in enthalpy is just going to simply be that purple arrow. That's the difference in enthalpy between the reactants and the products. Now we could also look at this in a slightly different way. So we've got the same enthalpy for the same reaction. We've got the same reactant enthalpy, the same product enthalpy. That's why they're on the same line. But this time, we're going to have an intermediate step. So the reactants are going to turn into an intermediate, and then they're going to turn into the products. And so from reactants to the intermediate step, we're going up the way. So this is going to be endothermic. So we've got delta H1. And then if we go down the way, we've got delta H2. So we're going from the intermediate step to the products. And actually, these two routes are going to give exactly the same value of delta H overall. And I can show you this with numbers. So if we just say that this reaction is minus 200 kilojoules for a certain um, amount of the substance, then we're going to have plus 100 from the reactants to the intermediate step, and then you'll be going down by minus 300. So on the left, when we're going reactant straight to products, we've got minus 200. And on the right, we're going up by 100 and then down by 300. And the interesting thing here is that minus 300 plus 100 is giving you minus 200. So it didn't matter that we went to the intermediate step. As long as we're careful with the signs and we take care of everything that's going on, we actually end up with the same overall delta H calculated. So that's the theoretical basis for Hess's law. Now let's look at how you actually do the calculations. And so I'm going to teach you with a thermochemical cycle because that helps you understand exactly everything that's going on and will support you with any kind of description questions. And then we'll look at a shortcut method at the end that lets you do it a bit faster, but you have to understand what's going on and be careful with the signs. So for the thermochemical cycle, you've got the reactants going into products, but then we take the reactants and imagine breaking them down into their constituent elements. So we end up with the elements. That's going to be our intermediate step. And then we reform all of those elements as products. And by looking up certain values in tables, we can work out exactly what the values on those two red arrows are going to be for the enthalpy change. And by using those numbers together, we can actually work out the overall enthalpy change for those reactants turning into products. And we'll look at how you do that. So here's our worked example. We're going to look at the enthalpy change for the formation of ammonium chloride. And so there is our reaction. And you've got to pay attention to the state symbols as well. So make sure you've got one, a balanced equation, and two, that you have the state symbols because that affects how you do the calculation. So first step is to break it into elements. So we've got our reactants here. And you notice we have one nitrogen. But nitrogen, for example, is diatomic. So as an element, it's going to be N2. So you can break down the nitrogen into N2. The hydrogens are going to become H2. And the chlorines are going to become Cl2. Again, all of these are diatomic, but you'll notice there's only one nitrogen, but it's turning into two. Well, that's not possible, so you're going to have to use some balancing numbers. So it's actually going to break down like this. So you can see that on the left, you've got one nitrogen, and then on the right, you've got half of N2, which is also one nitrogen. You've got four hydrogens on the left and four hydrogens on the right. 
You've got one chlorine on the left, one chlorine on the right. So this is showing you the decomposition into elements, and it works out nicely. So we can substitute these into our thermochemical cycle. So we've got that cycle there. And if we do the substitution, just replacing our reactants with reactants, products with products, and our elements with elements, we get this value. So the next step is we have to start looking at our data. And so we've got that data, which can be taken straight from Wikipedia or any textbook. You have to find these values somewhere. And so we know for those substances, there's a certain enthalpy change required for their formations. And you'll notice that a purple arrow has appeared. So you need to think about it kind of the other way around. So we've broken it down into elements, but we're thinking how much energy would be needed to turn those elements into the reactants. So for example, if we want to form NH3, that's going to take minus 46 kilojoules per mole because that's the way it's defined. It's defined as formation. So that's why we're thinking about the arrow going the other way. And to form HCl, that's going to need minus 92. So if we add those together, so we do minus 46 plus minus 92, we get minus 138. And so minus 138 is going to be the enthalpy change for forming those. And so if it's at minus 138 to form it, breaking it is going to be the opposite sign. So that red arrow is going to be plus 138. So you flip the sign and that flips the arrow round. Then we can think about the other arrow, which we have got to form ammonium chloride. And you can just read that straight off the table. That's minus 314. And so we can mark that on the diagram. So we've got those two red arrows marked in. And so we've got the thermochemical cycle completed with all the numbers we need. So the question now is, what is the enthalpy change? And we learned that it doesn't matter what route you take as long as you start and finish in the same place and that your route is valid. So what we can simply do is we can say that the enthalpy change is the 138 minus 114. So we're combining those two. And so we get minus 176 kilojoules per mole. And that is our final answer. There is a shortcut, but you've got to be careful in using this because you have to be very careful with the science. And you also need to understand that thermochemical cycle to be able to explain why this formula works. So the simple formula is that it's the sum of the change in enthalpy on formation minus the change in enthalpy of the reactants in their formation. And again, you can refer to that diagram, uh, rather the table, and then you can substitute in the values, but you've got to be extraordinarily careful with the um, sign. So I'd recommend using brackets and writing strange things like plus minus, but just so that you're explicitly clear on what the signs are. And if you combine all of that together, you get exactly the same answer. So hopefully Hess's law makes a lot more sense to you and you can access a nice, simple worked example. And then you can go forward and do some more complicated questions. Thank you very much for watching.